Okay, here we are in studio. We usually do these videos outdoors, in situ, out in the orchard, out in the garden, out in the fields. What's going on? Well, we're going to get another, we're on the verge of another atmospheric river of moisture. Uh, we've had a series, this will be the 10th one we've had since late December here. So here we are indoors. So we're making good use of the time when we can't be out in the field. And I thought, before you set yourself down on a piece of ground and get going with growing, you need to assess your soil. And you need to assess your soil so you can maintain and improve it. And so a soil test, there are a couple different routes you can go in assessing your soil. Uh, there's a qualitative set of things you can do. What is the color of your soil? What is the depth of your soil? What is the structure of your soil? Even what is the aroma of your soil? Good soil smells good. Um, how well does your soil drain? So these are all things you can do out in the field. Uh, but you also should do a quantitative uh, measurement of your soil. And that simply means get a soil lab test and interpret it. Um, there are some things you can see when you're looking at a soil, color, depth, structure, and some things you can't see. And that would be largely the full range of the 17 macro and micronutrients that plants need to grow, the pH. Um, and if all these things aren't up to a certain threshold, bad English as it is, the plant won't grow. The plant don't grow. So uh, that's something you do at the outset of any endeavor, backyard, garden, up to acres. But even more fundamental than that, you might want to pause and think about, well, what is my soil made up of? What's in my soil? And so we have here a rendering, a pie diagram. To me, this is beautiful and exciting. You may say, really? Seems flat and two-dimensional. Because this represents an idealized soil. Uh, there are four components in your soil. So when I grab a handful of soil, what have I got? Only about half or 50% of that volume is solid material. The other half, again, in a good soil, an ideal soil, the other half would be the pore spaces, the spaces between the solid particles. Um, consequently, uh, a good soil is relatively light in a comparative sense because it has a lot of air space, pore space in it. So let's look at this uh, diagram here and kind of talk about what, what, what are ideal percentages of the four components of a soil? Again, only half of that volume is solid material. The solid material is broken down into two components, the mineral component and the organic matter component. The mineral component I jokingly call rock flour or rock dust, flour, F-L-O-U-R. What is that? That's the largest percentage of this half of the total volume of the soil. The mineral component of your soil is composed of rocks that were broken down over geological time through weathering, uh, physical weathering, chemical weathering, and also biological activity. Um, so it's in the form we know of soil or rock flour or rock dust. And, and this is a little bit of a sad fact. Kind of the way it goes with soil is what you got influences so much what you're going to get. Okay, let me break that down. What you've got, what were the rocks that your soil was formed out of? Some rocks have more mineral nutrients than others. Basalt, mica, feldspars and such, uh, as say compared to sandstone, mudstone, quartz, and uh, granite. So the mineral content, the mineral nutrient content, of the rocks that your soil was broken down and formed out of will really largely give you or tell you what your fertility factor is. And that's just a given. So you hope you get a piece of ground that was rendered up out of more fertile rocks, but you might not. Um, and then you'll have to really work at improving that. So almost half, half of the volume of soil is composed of solids. Most of that is the mineral matter. Um, and again, what rocks was your soil formed out of that will determine how rich the soil is in terms of its nutrient content. 
And it also turns out that those rocks that I mentioned that are more rich in mineral nutrients tend to give you a clay texture and the less fertile rocks tend to give you a sand texture. Clays hold more water and nutrients than sands. Clays, although they can be problematic if they're tight and sticky, are inherently more fertile than sands. If I were given a choice, I would take a wicked sticky clay over a sand any day because I can improve that wicked sticky, sticky clay and I have some inherent base fertility there that's hard to beat. So most of the solid component of the soil is mineral matter and this little tiny sliver down here, 5% organic matter, and in truth, uh, you'd be lucky if you had 5% organic matter. It's often as low as 3% and that's sufficient. Uh, more is better with organic matter. But this, I call it the mighty fraction, organic matter. Its influence on the soil, its fertility, all of its properties, its biological, chemical, and uh, physical properties is way more significant than the small percentage represented here. And so organic matter, what is organic matter? Anything that used to be alive, plants, uh, debris of plants, uh, animals, uh, particularly microbes like that, but anything that was once alive when it is rotted down and stabilized is referred to as organic matter. So that's this side of the circle, 50% of the total volume of that handful of soil. The other, ideally, would be pore spaces, the gaps between the solids, or as the scientists say, the interstitial spaces between the solid particles. Uh, and at any given time, this ratio of 25% uh, of that total volume, or 50% of the pore space, should be occupied by air and similar percentages with water. That's just a good balance. Uh, you need the mineral component to supply nutrients for plant growth. You need the organic matter to supply also nutrients for plant growth and to work as a feedstock for the microbial community in your soil. The microbes in your soil break down organic matter and render the nutrients up as available to plants. So air and water are significant. Air, basically plant root growth is an aerobic activity. Plants need a lot of oxygen in the soil air. And the microbial community, again, needs a, let's call it, ginormous volume of oxygen to respire and to fuel their metabolism. Uh, water, well, water is the pulse of the planet. All things need water. Plants themselves are simply maybe referred to as uh, water encased by cellulose. They're really supported columns of water. Maybe as much as 75, 85% of a plant is water. The way that nutrients get into uh, plants is they're dissolved from the solid portion of the soil into the soil water, and then they essentially hitchhike a ride up into the plant with water. So this is your soil. This would be an idealized soil. If you had worked for a whole lot of years with good practices in terms of tillage, addition of organic matter via compost and cover crops, your soil might be represented by that, and that's a good thing. Uh, to the extent that it's not, uh, for instance, uh, compacted soils will have way less air, uh, way more water uh, like that. So you're working for this nice admixture of the four components in an ideal soil. So that's why I find this exciting because this is where we're headed. This is where we're going. This is the goal. Okay, we talked about the four components of soil. and Let's talk a little bit about the three principal properties of soil. But before I do that, let me go on a little more about organic matter. Organic matter, the joke is, it's almost a panacea. What is a panacea? One solution to all problems, ain't no such thing. And yet, almost no matter what's wrong with your soil, organic matter will be a part, maybe a big part of the solution. Uh, again, it's a very small fraction of the soil, as little as three to five percent, and it has a huge effect on all the properties of the soil. Um, and if you did nothing else but 
be frequently adding organic matter to your soil at least once a year. More often would be better via compost and cover crops turned in as green manures. You're probably going to be all right. Uh, but the soil has three properties. The physical properties, the chemical properties, and the biological properties. Um, the physical properties, what is the physical makeup of your soil? Such terms as texture, is it a sand or is it a clay? Uh, such terms as structure, how are those individual particles of sand, silt, and clay arranged in a secondary structure? We call this good structure or aggregates. They're just bigger units. Uh, to the degree your soil is well aggregated, that means you're going to have good pore space. That pore space can be ideally filled equally with water um, and air, and plants' roots can thrive, the microbial community can thrive. Uh, another uh, interesting, important aspect or term that's related to the physical properties of soil would be a thing called bulk density, and you can get this reflected in a soil test. And it's pretty simple. Bulk density is a measurement of the weight of the volume of any given soil, solids and pore space. So if you have an idealized soil in terms of having enough pore space in it, that soil will be lighter and your bulk density reading will be lower. It's a really narrow scale and you want to be somewhere, you would like to have a reading off a soil test somewhere between 0.8 and 1.2. And when I say it's a narrow scale, I mean when you get up a little bit, 1.75, that's actually uh, the bulk density of concrete, not what you're looking for in soil. So really narrow range, 0 0.8, 1.2, uh, and organic matter is an aid in that regard, giving you a structure that allows for a lot of pore space and a lighter soil. So uh, texture, structure, uh, bulk density are primary things relating to the physical properties of soil. And when you work a soil, however you choose to work it, whatever implement, whatever scale you're working on, you're basically working on the physical properties. What is the makeup of that soil? One of the things you want to do with cultivation or tillage is to open up a soil and create more pore space. Uh, more pore space, a nice permeable open surface to the soil so that water can hit the soil, infiltrate, percolate, and, and drain off. And also it's very important to have an open permeable soil surface to facilitate air gas exchange in and out of the soil. Um, over time, even over a very short period of time, carbon dioxide levels in the soil build up principally as a result of the respiration of microbes and it can be toxic and it needs to get out of the soil. Over time, the oxygen content of soil air depletes. It's being used by both plant roots and microbes and you need to refurbish it, replenish it. And by having an open uh, soil with good structure, lots of pore space, uh, continuous pore space from the surface down to the subsoil. It simply allows for a passive process called diffusion. Uh, basically, things move from areas of greater concentration to lesser concentration. In this instance, a high concentration of CO2 in the soil can get up through the channels in the soil and out into the atmosphere. And similarly, the atmospheric air can move down into the soil to re replenish the oxygen content. So the physical properties of soil. The chemical properties of soil simply is a measurement of the nutrient content and the pH of the soil, a few other allied uh, topics, and it's best rendered through a soil test. It's pretty cut and dry. It needs to be measured in a lab uh, like that. Uh, and the third property, which is, I might add, also, the one that's most neglected in ag soils textbooks, but I think it's the most important one, is the biological properties of the soil. What is the microbial life in your soil? Again, more is better. I find it interesting that in Europe they refer to organic growers, farmers and gardeners, as biological growers. And I think that's perhaps a more apt term of all the three properties. We as organic growers are really focused on enhancing the biological properties of the soil. We do that by creating a good physical environment through our practices of cultivation and tillage and the addition of organic matter, cover crops and compost. Uh, and we do that by, by uh, making sure we have adequate nutrient content in, in the soil and that will facilitate a robust microbial community, the biological properties of a soil.
again, uh, there are two ways to assess your soil, qualitative measures out in the field, things that are tactile and visual, um, and then uh, quantitative means, and that is principally taking a soil sample, sending it off to a reputable soil lab, and uh, getting the results, somehow interpreting the results. Maybe you can interpret them yourself, one great thing about good labs is they help you along, they nurse you along like this. I recommend a, a, a lab called A and L lab, Labs. Uh, it's capital A, capital L. And we use the Western uh, one because we're in the West, but they have a Canadian one, a Southern one. They have regional ones all around the country. But A&L labs are excellent. Um, and what I found with our Western A&L labs is, boy, they will work with you to help you zero in on what nutrients you need to add and in what amounts. Um, so uh, we have a plot at the farm we're monitoring for the planting and the growing of a small orchard block, a blend of pears and apples. And so we did a soil test. Um, I don't want to talk about the entire soil test and its results, but I want to hit on a few important metrics here. So uh, I've already talked about, I will talk more about, I will probably go on endlessly talking about the significance and the importance of organic matter. So let's start with that. If you look on this column here, uh, organic matter, it's a percent rating, and it's 4.3. One thing that helps you with these soil tests is they'll give you a little uh, uh, Q. H means high, M means moderate, and L means low. Uh, so generally, you expect uh, in the western part here of the country in California, uh, organic matter rates three to maybe if you're lucky, 5%. Uh, this is 4.3 and is considered relatively high. I want to note that during the pandemic years, we were fallow at the UCSC farm. Nada, nothing happened. So we didn't grow crops, but we grew pretty well. But we also didn't till the soil. And then this last year, uh, in the spring of 22, we did comprehensive soil tests. And pretty much across the board, our organic matter content went up one full number, from about 3% to about 4%. And this is, we thought this was perhaps a statistical error. We referred to the soil lab. They said, nope, that's right. And the reason is because we didn't till or cultivate. There are many needs to till or cultivate the soil, and there are a lot of benefits, but anytime you're working or tilling the soil, you are burning up your organic matter. You are adding air to the soil that stimulates the microbial community. They decompose the organic matter in the soil, so essentially you're burning your organic matter up. Now, again, doing tillage or cultivation in a skilled manner with good timing and not overdoing it, probably has a lot of benefits that you need to avail yourself of. But just, it's interesting. We didn't till for a couple years and our organic matter jumped up. So we have an organic matter content of 4.3%. That's pretty good. Um, and yet, if you look at the second line here horizontally, you look at our nitrogen content. Uh, it reads five. The, the Almost all the numbers that are in this soil test are parts per million. So it registers as five parts per million, our nitrate nitrogen content. Nitrate is the form of nitrogen that is most available, most immediately available to plants. And this is low. <clears throat> Dare I say pathetically so? Yeah, sure. Uh, you would like your nitrate nitrogen levels to be 20 parts per million up to maybe 50 parts per million. So this is significantly low here. Uh, a cause for concern? Yeah, maybe, I guess. Oh, let's look back up here at the top and, and, and uh, move across. Uh, after the organic matter column, we see ENR and 116. And I might note this is an exception. All the other numbers here are parts per million on this test, but the ENR is in pounds per acre. ENR stands for estimated nitrogen release. There's a way that they can calculate what is most, 
Most of your nitrate, nitrogen, particularly in organic systems, is tied up in the organic matter or the humus stabilized. And that's good because it prevents it from leaching. And that's maybe not so good because it's not readily available to plant growth. It becomes available to plants via the microbial decomposition of the microbes in your soil, the enzymatic decomposition, I should say. So it so slowly is bled out for plant use. And this estimated nitrogen release is a calculation of, based on your organic matter content, 4.3% here, you will have approximately 116 pounds of nitrate nitrogen available to your plants this growing season. And that's probably, adequate. Most veg crops, flowers, etc., need somewhere between 80, 100, up to 150, 175 pounds of nitrogen uh, per year. So you've got a pretty good storehouse of organic matter, of, of uh, uh, nitrogen that's locked up in your organic matter. And again, it's slowly made available. And this is good in one sense, because if you put two, if you put a ton, not literally, or maybe literally, a ton of nitrogen fertilizer on your soil, uh, it's kind of here today, gone tomorrow. It's readily leached, and there's some real dangers, and there's some real problems in agricultural areas of nitrate tainting of the water table. Uh, the, the point is also that nitrogen is expensive. You're not getting a good return on your investment. Uh, some is used, much is leached. And if you are, say, a fruit tree grower, uh, uh, using chemical fertilizers, you would put a nitrogen fertilizer of, with as much as 40% nitrogen on it. As an organic grower, you'd be hard pressed to find a nitrogen fertilizer that had more than 12% blood meal, bad guano, like that. And anything with 5 or 6% nitrogen or higher is good as far as being a good nitrogen source for uh, organic growers here, organic fertilizers. So we've got a pretty good stock of nitrogen tied up as it is in the, uh, in the organic matter and slowly made available uh, over time. So uh, let's kind of move down the line here and I like to pause here at Na or sodium. Uh, and oh look, we have a low reading, 30 parts per million. This is good. This is the only place where you want a low reading. Uh, sodium, too much sodium salts in the soil is really deleterious for plant growth. It prevents water and nutrient uptake. It can even cause the plants to wilt, cause st causes stunted growth. So a low reading general recommendation is less than 100 parts per million. We're at 30, we're good. You need to be a little bit careful with sodium accumulation in the soil, um, particularly if you're using animal manures. Uh, there's a lot of sodium salts in animal manure. Chicken manure is probably the highest sodium uh, salt containing of manure. So you're simply monitoring your sodium content over time. And uh, in one sense, oh, we're having a 10th atmospheric river. One thing that's good about rain and winter rains we get here in California is, is sodium is one of the more easily leached nutrients. You can get it down out of the root zone uh, uh, pretty readily with rain. And we're having an epic wet year, so we should be good uh, like that. Something you want to keep an eye on over time. Uh, one other thing here to look at among the myriad things that are here is the category that says cation exchange capacity or CEC. And uh, uh, our reading is 8.4. Uh, cation, in a nutshell, cation exchange capacity refers to the ability of your soil to hold on to cation, positively charged nutrients like calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium, and keep them from leaching downward like that. To hold on to them uh, and then to release them slowly into the soil solution and or directly to uh, plant roots for growth. And it's a scale again, and more is better again. Um, sands typically have, so your texture 
will somewhat inherently determine what your CEC or cation exchange capacity is. Uh, SANs generally have as little as one to maybe 10. SILTs and LOMs have maybe up to 15 uh, CEC count. Anything above 15 up to 30 would probably be a clay. And again, a higher number reflects there's more nutrients available for plant growth. I will add again, big fan as I am of organic matter, small but mighty fraction in the soil, that the CEC of organic matter is between 200 and 400. That's insane. So that's why it has such a profound effect on the soil. A small fraction, three to five percent in terms of the makeup of your soil, but loaded with nutrients. Let's talk a little bit about micronutrients. These are nutrients that are needed in very low amounts. They're not unimportant, but low amounts. Um, so if we look across the test here, zinc, manganese, iron, copper, and boron, we're listed as high or very high with all but boron. The boron is listed as low. And um, let me just say, be very careful with adding boron in any form to the soil. Uh, once it's in the soil, it's hard to get it out, and very quickly you could reach a level that would cause plant toxicity. Uh, the better assessment of do you need to add boron to the soil would be assessed via tissue analysis or leaf analysis, which is a simple test that labs can do, but be very careful. And let me also say, if you have a need for micronutrients as reflected uh, by a test, one uh, good route to go is horse manure. It's pretty, particularly zinc, iron, and manganese. It has a pretty good content of it, uh, composted horse manure. And the other thing, and it's kind of an organic grower's insurance policy against any type of a micronutrient deficiency, would be kelp products. Either meals or in a liquid form put on the soil or in a liquid form sprayed on the underside of leaves. Uh, very quick acting. Uh, and sometimes that's necessary. One particular crop that sometimes shows, particularly in the winter, particularly in cold wet winters as we're having this year, that shows up is what would be called an intervenal chlorosis on citrus leaves. Intervenal, that is, the veins on the leaf are green. In between, intervenal is kind of bleach yellow like that. And it usually indicates a deficiency of iron, zinc, and manganese. Could be one, two, or all three of those. And here's the deal. Usually, if you're just patient and you wait when things dry down and warm up in the spring, it's not that you, per se, that you don't have those micronutrients in your soil. It's just they're restricted because the conditions are cold and wet. When the soil dries and warms in the spring, often the flow is back uh, on track and the leaves green up. But if you don't have that happening, you can use kelp products in one form or another to get a quick giddy up, as it were. And the quickest way to fertilize anything would be with a foliar feed because you're spraying that liquid kelp on the underside of the leaves in uptake through the stomates, the fine openings on the underside of the leaf, and it's into the plant today. Now, it, this is also something that works better for things you need in small amounts, in this case, micronutrients, uh, but it's a real quick acting uh, solution to some problems, again, in this case, an iron, zinc, manganese deficiency in citrus. Let's talk a little bit about pH. It's a scale from 0 to 14. 0 to 7 indicates uh, you have an acidic soil. 7 up uh, to 14 indicates an alkaline soil. And the significance of pH is that uh, nutrient availability is restricted except for a relatively narrow band. Ideally, for most crops, you would want a pH of, say, 5.8 to 7.0, maybe 7.2. Uh, fruit trees, particularly apples, are pretty tolerant, so anywhere in that range is okay. Um, our pH reading came back again as 5.8, and so the um, 
lab recommended uh, a set of fertilizers to put on. And let's just look at the uh, recommendation for uh, adjusting the pH upward. And our magnesium was moderate to a little bit of low. So instead of recommending uh, calcium carbonate limestone, uh, they recommended a different type of limestone fertilizer. It's called dolomite, and it has calcium and magnesium in it. So it's a twofer, as it were. I'll help you with your magnesium issues like that. So they recommend putting on 2,000 pounds to bring the pH up to 6.5. And that's kind of smack dab in the middle of where you want to be. Let me say a couple other things about a, a lime application. One, lime is relatively to really cheap, say compared to nitrogen fertilizer. Um, the recommendation here is for 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And that's gonna be, especially on an organic basis, pretty pricey. My preference would be to build the organic matter so you have a higher e, uh, e estimated nitrogen release annually and to be constantly using compost and cover crops, which again are gonna bring up the nitrogen content of the soil. But this recommendation of uh, 2,000 pounds to the acre is not too pricey and can help bump the pH up to 6.5, say, and you, the result is you'll have greater nutrient availability, both macro and micro nutrients, and, that, and that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing about the application of lime, uh, unlike nitrogen, which is really quick act acting, its effect on the soil is somewhat slow, can take as much as three to six months. So a typical way you would approach applying limestone or dolomite is to do it in the end of the summer or the fall for a spring planting. The big three, uh, that's not car makers. Uh, that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, uh, N, P, and K. And you often see that reflected on a bag of fertilizer. What is the percent of N, P, K? Uh, we talked about nitrogen. Phosphorus is uh, dynamic. It, uh, phosphorus has a, a domain, as it were, over root growth, particularly early root growth, getting things off to a good start in the spring. Uh, and very important with fruit trees, flowering, fruiting, and sugar content. Yeah phosphorus. Uh, and potassium, potassium regulates both water uptake and again nutrients are delivered up and from the soil into the plant via water, so it's a good thing. Uh, potassium also optimizes, regulates or optimizes photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is all about capturing sunlight and converting it to carbohydrates which form the structure of the tree and yield energy for growth of the tree. So they're very important. Now our readings here are reasonable. A um, uh, moderate reading of 22 parts per million. Basically with phosphorus you want to be 20, maybe up to 50 or so. Um, and uh, so it's a, a moderate reading, I'm not concerned. And with potassium, you want to be 130 up to 150, maybe 175. So I'm not concerned. Uh, the folks down at the soil lab have some concerns. Uh, um, so they recommended an application of 80 pounds uh, to, to the acre of phosphorus and 90 of potash. I'm okay with our phosphorus levels plus. We are adding compost at a rate of about five to 10 uh, tons to the acre per annum. And animal manures can contain both a good deal of phosphorus and potassium. So in a gentle, slow way over time, I think we'll maintain and increase those uh, nutrients uh, in the soil. Plus we are just really voracious cover croppers. So we're growing cover crops and cover crops, particularly legumes and mustards are really good at scavenging for um, phosphorus, take it up in their plant parts. When you chop that down and turn it into soil, it liberates that phosphorus in a very available form for immediate use by plants. So I'm okay with maybe not applying any phosphorus or potassium fertilizer here.